Shabbat Shalom. You know that summer has ended when you can no longer get a table at your favorite restaurant? You know that summer has ended, you know, when the electric bill is not quite as high? You know that summer has ended when we reach the last Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah. I know that summer has ended when all that wellness I experienced on some Swiss mountaintop is as if it never was. I know that summer has ended when just for a brief moment I catch myself fantasizing that I should have listened to that little voice inside of me urging me to reconsider returning at all. I could just spend the rest of my days on this mountain. Why not? I'm an adult. I've always felt closer to God on top of a mountain. I am a man of God, or at least a student of God. Why not just stay up there full time? In New York City, you know, with all the hustle and bustle and noise and crowds and projects and deadlines, who has time to think of higher, more spiritual thoughts? Who has time to consider heaven? If you happen to find yourself on a European mountain in summer on a sunny day, it's about as close to heaven as it gets on Earth. But even though I felt closer to God up there. As you see, I returned, like you. We have returned because deep down, we know that real life is deep down in the depths, in the valley of life. This is where meaning is. Really, this is where happiness resides. There is no absolute bliss in human existence. There is no perfect happiness. Happiness is frustration. <laughs> happiness is struggle. Despite what all those self-help gurus tell us all day and all night. It's why the American founding fathers identified the pursuit of happiness, not the arrival. If we actually found happiness, we'd be miserable. <laughs> no one can endure total contentment. And even heaven may not be all that it is cracked up to be. Samuel Butler imagined heaven as slightly frustrating. What a great thought. Even he heaven has its niggling frustrations. Even the Garden of Eden was boring for Adam and Eve, they were restless in paradise. And for rabbis, there's an additional consideration that propels us to get off the mountain and return to the city. No one knows us on the mountain. No one thinks of us. It might seem heavenly for about a week, but for rabbis, being ignored is worse than all the complaints about to descend upon us because of something we said on the high holy days or didn't say. Actually, for rabbis, heaven is being in the fray, criticism and all. Hell, for rabbis, is irrelevance. It may be bliss for some religious personalities to meditate, day after day on a mountaintop, not speaking with another human soul for weeks on end, but for rabbis? This is the definition of torture. <laughs> In the picture of Dorian Gray, the book about that rascal who thought that staying young forever would be heaven itself, Oscar Wilde writes, there is one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. So I've returned. <laughs> and I know that summer is over when our many hundreds of school children return to the synagogue and fill the classrooms with study. Religious school started on Sunday. Nursery school started yesterday. Study is what Jews do. And for me, heaven 
and sitting in my office, listening to the chanting of the Torah from eager and confident B'nai Mitzvah students, passionately bellowing out their parsha, the words of God echoing from Cantor Singer's office, enveloping the entire second floor in holiness, heaven itself. Hearing Jewish children chanting the eternal values of God. The source of the Jewish command to study and to learn is in this week's Torah portion, Nitzavim Vayelech. Moses assembled the people. Among his last words on his last day of his life are these, Ve'ata kitvu lachem et hashira hazot velamda. Write down these words and study them. Jews emphasize study. We are the people of the book. Spartans admired strength. Athenians admired beauty, Romans admired power, Jews admired learning. The Greek and Roman hero was Hercules. The Jewish hero was Rabbi Akiva. The closest we have in our tradition to a superman like Hercules was Samson. You remember what happened to him? He met his inglorious end, tempted by the beauty of Delilah. Her cunning led to his downfall. In Jewish tradition, smarts always prevails over brute strength. The Talmud states that a sage outranks a prophet. We have inherited that value of Jewish study, whether we are observant or not. It's why you're so educated and why you are training your children and dreaming that your grandchildren will attend the finest schools and universities in the land. You know, we have nursery school parents who teach their children music while they are still fetuses. They listen to Mozart in utero. It is astonishing to see how many Jews are so intellectually accomplished. And in New York City, forget about it. Our American freedom has liberated Jews to be the best that we can be, and our emphasis on learning has propelled us to the very heights of American society. But on this eve of Rosh Hashanah, I urge you to reflect on what it is that you want to know Spend these next couple of weeks pondering not only the value of a diploma, of knowledge, but also the value of wisdom. There are plenty of smart people in the world who make dumb decisions. Do you know that smart people need to be told not to text message while they're driving? You've got all these computer whizzes and multitaskers who don't even realize that it's not a good idea to hold your handheld device and write on it while you're driving 70 miles an hour? <laughs> Did you know that we have to pass laws nowadays forbidding driving and texting that some PhDs from select universities don't know that on their own? And that it's not generally a good idea to shave or apply lipstick while you're driving? <laughs> Degrees are not the measure of everything. In your workplace, would you rather have a colleague who is an untrustworthy and unreliable genius, or one of average intelligence who excels in loyalty, teamwork, and discipline? Would you rather be married to a misogynist genius like Picasso or a hardworking, loyal spouse who paints in his spare time? Who would you rather have running your bank? The one who was the smartest at business school, who effortlessly passed every exam with flying colors, who could devise all kinds of financial schemes that no one else could even understand? Or 
the one who might have been in the middle of the class, but is patient, who could sit still for a while at least and focus on what is at the task at hand and does not have constant need for stimulation, more excitement and more profit, who would take the time to analyze deeply what is presented? What's the difference between a guy with a mask running into a bank and stealing your money and a guy with a diploma who lures you into a pyramid scheme to steal your money? A diploma doesn't make you smarter. The scarecrow didn't need that piece of parchment from the Wizard of Oz to validate his intelligence. And a diploma doesn't make one any more moral. A diploma measures basically one thing, academic intelligence. It does not measure emotional intelligence. It does not measure heart or value or, eth or values or ethics or decency. There are people who attend the best colleges in the world and do the worst deeds. It's too bad that the most evil are not also the least intelligent. It's too bad. Remember those of us who traveled to Eastern Europe together? We went to Vansay and we saw on the wall the participants of the Vansay conference that planned the final solution, half of them carried the title doctor. Half of them were PhDs. Higher education does not prom promise higher understanding. Superior schools do not guarantee superior satisfaction. Elite education does not guarantee elite wisdom. In fact, honestly, truthfully, elite education tends to breed elitists. Judaism discouraged elitism. Our sages insisted be of the people, that we share society's pain and consider it our responsibility to ease the burdens of others. Higher learning tends to breed a high self-worth. A sense of self is good. We need that to accomplish and succeed in life and to maximize our potential. But graduates with inflated grades tend to inflate their own worth. They tend to be arrogant. Intelligence is prone to arrogance. We can split the atom, but we have sown the seeds of our own destruction. We have built such sophisticated machines that we can't turn them off when they go wrong. We have so rep refined and computerized the accumulation of wealth that milliseconds of trading can bring down the world economy. We're so smart that what took centuries to build up could be torn down in a day. It's good for you to take time off from your academic pursuits and your professional responsibilities and reflect in synagogue on what do you want to do with all the knowledge that you have accumulated? What information is important to you? I conclude with a prayer from a learned and brilliant Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. It's good to think of these things during the high holy days. Dear God, bring perspective to my life. For the meaningless allures of this world control me. Let me see beyond the coarse requirements of my daily subsistence. Let me bask in what is truly precious in the beauty of my relationships, help me fix within my mind the enduring truths of life. Let every action be directed towards life's ultimate goals. As I age, as the hours turn to days, days to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years, let none of my time be wasted or lost let me use my life to the fullest to become the person I was meant to be. Shabbat shalom and shana tovah.